Next, it's AMC FX, where the best of Hollywood effects come at you from both sides. Behind the screen with the AMC original series, Cinema Secrets. And on the screen with the AMC FX movie of the week. That's coming up next. The following is being sponsored by Subaru. Only Subaru puts full-time all-wheel drive on every car they make. Subaru, the beauty of all-wheel drive. The Outback has finally come to town. Introducing the Subaru Outback Sedan. A completely new kind of car that combines the rugged traction and control of full-time all-wheel drive with a decidedly uptown look. My car is town. Outback Sedan, yet another first from Subaru. Welcome to AMC EFX, our look at special effects behind the scenes and up on the big screen. I'm Stan Winston. Space may have been the final frontier for Captain Kirk, but it was one of the first frontiers for filmmakers, dating back to George Melier's A Trip to the Moon in 1902, and at the end of the century, movies like Galaxy Quest and Armageddon proved that our fascination with space was still going strong. Tonight, we'll look at the myriad of ways, both high-tech and low-tech, that filmmakers have used over the years to take audiences to the stars. Cinema Secrets is next. into space and has a close encounter with a bizarre extraterrestrial without ever leaving Hollywood. Visual effects produce the most explosive event in the universe never seen by human eyes and the secret behind Apollo 13's stunningly realistic zero gravity. Only filmmakers can launch audiences into space. From futuristic rocket ships to groundbreaking effects techniques, discover how intergalactic action is staged right here on Earth. Next on Cinema Secrets. While the far reaches of space remain light years away for actual astronauts, cinema voyagers have been exploring the universe for a century. The challenge facing all Earth-bound filmmakers is to create their own vision of space. And special effects have played an integral role. Today, many science fiction filmmakers opt to be as scientifically accurate as possible. All right, guys, here we go. Pictures out. The sci-fi comedy Galaxy Quest, director Dean Pariseau took substantial creative license. <laughs> The result was a humorous depiction of space inspired by earlier Hollywood hits. I was always a big fan of like the Flash Gordon movies where the, the, the really bad little plastic spaceship would kind of go like this and always crash. They seem to always use the same shot. And I was delighted to see our little vessel that takes us to the planet was the same kind of like fish-shaped little terrible looking plastic thing. When the script called for their ship to be under fire, a huge interior set was rattled on a hydraulically operated shaker platform called a gimbal. The gimbal, which was sometimes very frightening, at least all we, all we had to do was what was real, which was hold on. The largest such platform ever built. It was operated by special effects supervisor Matt Sweeney. We put the whole set up on pieces of apparatus called air bearings that are like little tiny hovercraft. So the whole thing was floating on a cushion of air. And we ran six big giant hydraulic rams with huge hoses where we could just shake this thing back and forth ferociously. You 
But the film's crowning effects achievements are its extraterrestrials. To populate the movie with aliens that could perform on set, Academy Award winner Stan Winston used advanced makeup techniques and animatronic puppets. What creates a character is not just what it looks like, and in fact, less of what it looks like, much more of how it performs what it does. Once you buy into and accept that character's performance, the icing on the cake is how really neat that character looks too. For the film's villain, General Saris, actor Robin Sachs provided the performance after enduring a four-hour makeup process to be outfitted with the alien head and costume. But some creatures couldn't be performed by an actor in a suit. Here, eight technicians used rods to maneuver a puppet's appendages as it was pulled to camera. These squid-like aliens, called thermians, were molded in foam latex by Winston's team, then airbrushed to give them a glistening alien sheen. For a key shot revealing the thermians, the puppets were filmed on a blue screen set. Puppeteers used blue covered rods to lift the thermian tentacles. Ultimately, all of the blue material was digitally replaced with the desired background setting. In this case, Galaxy Quest's futuristic spaceship. Our most sincere apologies. The movie's wildest extraterrestrial encounters take place on a primitive alien planet. The filmmakers searched far and wide for a landscape that was suitably out of this world. They found it in the eerie red rock formations of Goblin Valley, Utah. In the movie, the Galaxy Quest crew lands on the alien planet to find fuel. It's a setup for one of the movie's signature scenes, which finds Tim Allen waking a life force that takes the form of a giant rock monster named Grignac. Oh, darn. We saw the first digital image of it. Everybody went, damn. What a cool idea. And the more they did it than ILM, the people that did the CGI, the computer work. Once it started getting better and better, you're going, this, we've got to show more of this thing, because it was really cool. Grignac's creators at Industrial Light and Magic sought to make the monster an original. We wanted it to be an abstraction, and we came up with the concept that the creature isn't the rocks. It's some sort of electrical field that it has to manifest itself by picking up objects and creating a body for itself. And it just happens to do those with the rocks. One of the very first things we did was a maquette. I basically took coal, which is a really great scale rock, and I cobbled the rocks together uh, to look like a creature. Forty artists worked for three months to give life to the pile of rocks. Sonny Way used this sculpture as reference to build a CG Grignac. Once formed, it was time to determine the alien's rocky gait. So I thought, you know, I want this guy to have a big lumbering walk because his legs are kind of spread apart. So I thought I'd get a good sway to him and it'll really look like he's bringing that weight over his legs. And even though he's moving pretty quick, you know, you get this goo, goo and it just makes him look like he's scarier and moving faster. Walking wasn't enough. Grignac also had to leave his mark on the planet. I took pictures of the ground, like I would take a big rock and throw it on the ground and see how the ground was affected. We even videotaped, you know, throwing the rock on the ground and seeing how the sand exploded and, and the way that the, the sand broke up around it. The video helped Ed Kramer design software that would simulate the dusty trail left by the grinding of Grignac's stone bones. To complete the illusion, it was essential to have Tim Allen interact with the digital monster. Key shots showing Allen's character being tossed around were filmed in front of a blue screen using an elaborate wire rig system. The blue screen would later be replaced by footage of Grignac in the alien landscape. A stuntman doubled for Allen in the scene's roughest moments. The, sh the next shot, we see what it is that's dragging him, which is a rock monster, which is a huge creature that will be created in CGI that drags him, basically picks him up, looks at him, and then throws him away. 
For this shot, stuntman John Casino was picked up by a harness attached to wires running to a pulley system. It was operated by a team of off-camera engineers. The scene called for his shirt to rip off as he's dragged across the ground. Fishing line, invisible on camera, was attached to Casino's shirt and pulled during filming. Three, two, one, go! Lift! Tim Allen was then summoned for perhaps the most uncomfortable day of his acting career. Like the stuntman, Allen was suspended from the wire rig in the constricting body harness. Go! How's that harness feel? Well, how do you think it feels? You've got my genitals in a noose, and I'm upside down, and I haven't eaten. I'm blue in the face, and they're going, you feel all right? You know, it's... You know, and you feel like such a wuss saying, I gotta get down. I gotta get down. Adding to the challenge, Alan had to perform solo in front of the blue screen. Going and action. Action to what? Cut. Grignac is coming over the, that rise to your left there, okay? About here, yeah. And he's coming towards you at a high rate of speed, and he's made out of rock. Thanks. Action. Ah, cut. What? He's not that direction. A little more to your left. Try another one. Back to number one. Finally, the live action footage from the blue screen stage is combined with the Goblin Valley backgrounds and the computer generated alien beast. The point of this distinctive quest finds Tim Allen face to stone face with an alien creature unlike any seen before. Working in special effects has its perks. For some of the Galaxy Quest team, it meant a role in the movie. The finale has a spaceship carrying the crew crash land into a sci-fi convention. The ILM team accomplished this by building a fifth scale miniature convention and driving a model spaceship through it. While the impact was spectacular, they wanted more drama, so effect supervisor Bill George called upon his crew, filming them fleeing in fear on a blue screen stage. So we all make cameo appearances in the film. <laughs> a moment of screen time for the artists behind the camera. Coming up, the sequel. Hi, I'm Jody Foster. Just like everyone, I got my favorite films. And it's scary to think that someday they could just disappear. Fear not. Thanks to the art of film preservation, everyone's favorite films can be restored and protected. And AMC is committed to just that. Once I want to do something right! Join me each week for another classic movie worth preserving. Watch AMC's Film Preservation Classics with Jodie Foster every Saturday at 12.30, only on AMC. We'll do the hard part. All you have to do is watch them. You know him as a klutz. <laughs> Oh, that's terrific. A clown and his Dean Martin's ex-partner. But Jerry Lewis had another face. He invented the secret formula for genius when he created Buddy Love. I love you, baby. Mean it sincerely. A character that revealed his own dark side. I don't recall dismissing you. Don't miss Jerry Lewis's comic masterpiece. It was a toe tapper. I must admit that. The Nutty Professor. Friday, January 21st at 8 p.m. Eastern, only on AMC. Well, just don't do something. Sit there. Since the very first movies, filmmakers have been fascinated with the cosmos, and they've relied on special effects to create their visions. The first film to attempt a serious portrayal of space travel was director Fritz Lang's 1929 effort, The Woman in the Moon. The movie pioneered a number of effects techniques, including miniatures to put the first multi-staged rocket on film and suspending actors on wires for the first portrayal of zero gravity. The wires were lit to blend in with the rocket ship set. To create the illusion of the ship orbiting around the moon, a paper mache model was rotated on a drum just in front of the camera lens. 
and to depict a lunar landscape inside a studio set, Lang imported tons of sand that he bleached stark white. Five, four, three, two, fire. A leap forward in cinematic space travel came with George Pal's 1950 adventure, Destination Moon. I could have blown my brains out of gone over Niagara Falls in a barrel or found some other decent way to die. Pal amazed audiences with the illusion of the most realistic rocket ever by combining a four-foot miniature with a full-size tail section. The most groundbreaking shot in the film was an uninterrupted pan of the lunar surface, something that could not be achieved on a soundstage. To accomplish this, Pal hired renowned space artist Chesley Bonestell to paint a 13-foot-long moon vista. 534 holes were punched in the artwork and lit from behind, creating a star field. Wheels on the bottom of the painting allowed it to be rolled in front of the camera. In 1964, a group of filmmakers quietly began working on a three-year project that would revolutionize the art of visual effects. For 2001, A Space Odyssey, director Stanley Kubrick envisioned a serene, highly choreographed dance of majestic spacecraft and luminous planets. It was a big experimental movie. No one really knew how to do it or what it should look like. Uh, it was totally different from any movies that had ever been made using normal Hollywood techniques. Only 23 at the time, Douglas Trumbull was one of the visual effects pioneers who created the poetic space flights for Kubrick. What he wanted to make was a visual experience for the audience. This was for the audience to go into space. The team developed an innovative mechanically driven camera that resulted in the smoothest shots of miniatures ever achieved. This stylistic choreography wasn't limited to exterior shots. One of the most spectacular scenes in 2001 has actor Gary Lockwood jogging around the rotating space station. This illusion was filmed inside a 38-foot diameter centrifuge. A camera was mounted into a slot in the set floor. The centrifuge then rotated around the camera while Lockwood ran in place. 2001's visual effects mesmerized audiences and changed filmmaking forever. When the producers of 2010, the year we make contact, set out to surpass the artistic standards set by 2001, they relied on almost two decades of advances in visual effects technology. One aspect of space exploration that director Peter Hyams envisioned updating was the portrayal of weightlessness in space. In this scene, astronauts spacewalk between the Russian vessel Leonov and the Discovery. When making 2001 in 1965, actors performed in harnesses that allowed very limited movement. By 1983, new wire rig technology developed by Robert Harmon gave Hyams an advantage. Good, 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 good. They really have to move. Okay, that's number one. Two, this tether has to come around the other side because it's violating this movement. Okay, back to number one, please, everyone. Actors were attached to wires and flown in front of a blue screen background, which would be replaced with images of space. Harmon's rig gave the actors much more freedom of movement and more realistic floating. It proved to be a rousing experience for actor John Lithgow. It takes three men to fly one, and then you move yourself every other way just by shifting your weight. You spun around and twisted and turned. Just loved it. They kept telling me, John, just calm down up there. Astronauts in space, don't clown around. <laughs> to further enhance his film's depiction of weightlessness, Hyams and Roy Scheider attempted to show how objects float in space. A piece of glass was placed in front of Scheider and shot from an angle that concealed it. When Scheider stuck a pen to the glass, it would appear to float in midair. That was the plan, anyway. You have enough fuel in the Leonov for a trip back home. You have enough fuel aboard the Leonov for the trip home. 
Uh, <laughs> I'm so amazed by this. <laughs> 2010's incredibly realistic vision of streamlined vessels and astronauts adrift in the vast expanse of space continues to influence films into the 21st century. What science fiction classic that starred Leslie Nielsen was based on a Shakespearean play? The answer when we return. Behind every movie, there are hundreds of stories. There was a dark side to her. He was always toying with cocaine. It's just not something you talked about. And we can't resist a good story. That's why AMC brings you Hollywood Reel to Reel, a weekly pairing of a documentary. He got the kicked out of him as a kid. And a movie. Get up! Step inside classic Hollywood and experience both sides of the movies with Hollywood Reel to Reel, Tuesday at 8 p.m. Eastern, only on AMC. I recommend it. As strong in his own directing as he was in his screenwriting for others, he's Richard Brooks. Then see Brooks' film noir pulp, Brute Force, Tuesday at 8 on AMC's Hollywood Reel to Reel. So, what science fiction film was based on a Shakespearean play? The 1956 release, Forbidden Planet, was inspired by The Tempest. While much of Hollywood's vision of space has been speculation, the most challenging images are those we've become familiar with thanks to the space program. In 1995, director Ron Howard took the art of filmmaking into a whole new orbit with Apollo 13. Houston, we have a problem. He and his all-star cast were striving for absolute historical and visual accuracy including zero gravity beyond what could be achieved with traditional wire techniques. I was intrigued by the challenges of the weightlessness. I thought that would be interesting to try to solve. His quest led to the ultimate solution, NASA's jet used for training astronauts nicknamed the Vomit Comet. This airplane simulates weightlessness by flying in a wave-like pattern called parabolas. During each descent, the actors experienced nearly 30 seconds of zero gravity. Listen, as you get a little better at it, just start practicing moving around and just think in terms of trying to get from one specific place to the other. The Apollo capsule set was constructed inside the plane. Howard, the actors, and a handful of crew members flew over 300 parabolas in 13 days to shoot the zero gravity sequences. The resulting weightlessness gave Apollo 13 a stunning realism without leaving the stratosphere. It's all about imagining something and then actually somehow facilitating its execution. The makers of Supernova took their imaginations even further in their quest to capture on film the collapse of a distant star. Unable to board an intergalactic spaceship, they relied on visual effects to get them there. Many of the film's most demanding images were created by effects facility Digital Domain. Artists there designed Supernova's futuristic spaceship under the guidance of Mark Stetson. There have been many space movies made before Supernova was made, and uh, it's always interesting to find a new look and a new feel for a film. I think we've done a really good job working to come up with a design for the spaceship, which is something different. A 25-person crew spent eight weeks constructing a 19-foot-long Nightingale spaceship model out of steel, acrylic, and plastic. Prior to filming the model, Stetson created moving storyboards called pre-visualizations to simulate the camera moves. Once the motion was approved, the miniature Nightingale was filmed against a green screen that was later replaced with cosmic imagery. The Nightingale was then able to transport the cast and audience to the film's final destination.
the movie's ultimate achievement is the portrayal of a massive supernova. An event never witnessed by human eyes except in radio telescope photographs. In their pursuit of realism, the Digital Domain team referenced those photographs as well as NASA animation depicting a supernova. But in the interest of screen time, they condensed an event that takes many years into an explosive few minutes. We took a lot of artistic license with the, the stepping of the supernova, the, the speed at which it expands, but you have to do that for the movie to give it visual impact, otherwise it's too slow. To depict the exploding star's devastation of a distant moon, Kelly Port layered multiple computer-generated elements. Just to give you an idea of the few elements that are layered on this to make the final shot, here's one of the layers that's just the little bits of pieces being blown off the moon. Another layer is actually the moon itself, and then we also have kind of a dust stream, and the dust as it's flying off as this force of the shockwave blows it off. The result is cinema of epic proportions as an entire galaxy erupts right before our eyes. In their conquest of the heavens, filmmakers have given us visions of the far reaches of space. They've shown us amazing alien beasts and taken us deep into a distant galaxy. But until the day arrives that interstellar travel becomes a reality, Hollywood is our only true ticket to the stars.